Travis, thanks for the panel. I, it is wonderful to have Travis uh, Litwin back here. Proud alum, 2007? Six. 2006, cheating him a year. Uh, many of you know um, Travis has had a very proud record of public service, most recently serving as the chief of staff to the chairwoman of the FCC. Uh, and with no further ado, I will turn it over to Travis for our conversation. We're all very much looking forward to it. Travis, welcome back. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for being uh, so I am joined by two luminaries in the in the telecom field. To my immediate right is John Nectarline, currently a partner at Sidley Austin, but is a distinguished career of public service himself, having spent time as the general counsel of the FTC in the general counsel's office at the FCC, time uh, or time in the Department of Justice and, and working with the Solicitor General's office. So welcome, John. And then to John's right, Howard Shalansky, uh, currently a professor at Georgetown partner at Davis Polk, also has a distinguished uh, history of, of public service, having spent time as, uh, uh, in the FTC as a director of their Bureau of Economics, uh, as the administrator of uh, OIRA within the White House, and as uh, uh, time at the FCC as chief economist there. So please welcome uh, our distinguished um, conversants here who are we're going to reflect on digital um, crossroads, which is now Almost, almost going to be celebrating its 21st birthday. It can almost buy itself a drink. Um, but let's let's rewind back in time, close to 20 years ago. Uh, John, um, that was when the first edition of Digital Crossroads was published. And, and there had been books about telecommunications law before, but Digital Crossroads quickly found its niche by combining history, policy, law, economics, and in a reader-friendly fashion. So, what inspired you? And then uh, Professor now Attorney General Weiser to write the book in the first place. What was the state of the land technology-wise um, and, and what kicked off the impulse to write? So there was a bit of a market vacuum. The, um, the only book that um, people knew to the field uh, could read was a, a horn book. It was a, a, a treatise put together by lawyers at Howard's old law firm. And it was very much a, a legal treatise. And um, one of the things that I discovered after I left the Solicitor General's office to work at the FCC is that you can't really understand the field of telecom law and policy without understanding the economics and uh, technological and political dimensions of the field. And so the idea that Phil and I had, um, actually my first I was I can still remember this 2002. I was sitting in the tutorial about how a certain next generation networks work, and I was thinking back to when I was at the FCC listening to Dale Hatfield explain to me how IP TCP IP worked, and I was thinking, you know, I think we should do an, an interdisciplinary book that merges all economics and technology. And uh, I didn't have a title for it yet, but I knew there should be three authors. And it would be me, Phil Weiser, and Dale Hatfield. And I don't, I, somehow I think you must have uh, bowed out at some point, Dale, but uh, Phil and I ended up being the sole uh, authors of that book. And it did what I hoped it would do, which is to explain the intricacies of the field for people who are genuinely new to it. So engineers who don't know anything about law or lawyers who don't know anything about um, uh, uh, telecommunications network and uh, an economist as well who, who might be interested in the field. Uh, we, we wrote it for those people in mind. And in a way it was, uh, we also wrote it for our prior selves because I was one of those people at the FCC in the late nineties who was trying to figure out what, what this is all about sounded really interesting, but I found that as a lawyer, as a lawyer's lawyer, I didn't really understand as much as I wanted to about the economic and technological underpinnings of the field. That's, that's, that's what gave rise to the idea of the book. Was it a, a former SEC staff or anytime someone new would join the agency, the first thing that, that uh, was sort of became uh, um, a regular course was you have to go get digital crossroads because that is going to set the foundation for your understanding of the agency, for your understanding of the, the environment. So I think uh, the legacy, one of the legacies of, of, of the book is uh, uh, certainly that we found in your, your niche there. Um, another legacy, and, and Howard, I'd like you to first speak to this and then John maybe reflect on it too, is 
when you think about the intersection of, of economic theory and telecom where the rubber hits the road, you have concepts, uh, it might be new to some of the students in this room, but, but things like network effects, monopoly leveraging, economies of scale, creative destruction. As you reflect back on, on the, the legacy of this book over the last two decades, how relevant are those concepts to the world of telecom today? How relevant are they to the world of big tech today and in the future? Can you give us your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question, Travis. Um, you know, the book was really prescient in the sense that it had gotten ahead of the transformation uh, in the kinds of economics that were most relevant to telecom policy. So just 10 years before the book came out, what we were thinking about were things like uh, Ramsey pricing, where do you most optimally allocate subsidies and price controls and price caps? And what are the most, you know, best incentive networks for regulating the novel? And then what might be some incentive programs that would induce entry in, as we were opening up the market? The concepts like network economics and a lot of, you know, the monopoly leverage, leveraging is an old concept that in fact has sort of risen and died and is coming back a bit. But um, the, the, the whole way that network economics would factor in and where network barriers of entry, switching costs, demand side externalities would arise, that was something that was really just emerging with the rise of broadband, with the rise of a layer above the infrastructure that was pulling users into various kinds of services and onto various kinds of networks. And if anything, those concepts have only become increasingly relevant and are increasingly part of the story of how we think about what telecommunications policy or network policy or the big tech platform policy should be going forward. John, any reflections on, on, on how the, the, the lifeblood of the, the economics uh, is a through line through, through both editions and continues to present that? Absolutely. And I, I think what one, one of the fascinating things about telecom policy is to sort of um, Many of the concepts are critical to understanding complicated issues uh, for big tech as well. So when you think about core concerns that underlay the Telecommunications Act of 1996, those same concerns are also applicable to tech players as well. So you had network effects, which um, the 96 Act dealt with through interconnection obligations. You had um, switching costs, which the 96 Act dealt with uh, with three uh, number of portabilities. And you had uh, enormous scale economies, which the, uh, the difficulty of new interest replicating the essential facilities of the existing incumbents uh, that we dealt with through unbundled network elements in the obligation. All those things have uh, counterparts in today's debates about um, how to address competition issues. So just to take a couple of examples, we hear a lot about um, uh, legislative proposals mainly for interoperability among platforms uh, that has a kind of a direct conceptual connection to uh, the interconnection debates that we remember 20 years ago. Uh, data portability obviously bears a strong resemblance to uh, number portability. And the list sort of goes on. And so the, the, the basic policy issues have kind of distinct counterparts in today's debates as well. And I think you know, as we look forward to the third edition of this book, one of the things we're going to do is try to make those connections more explicit than they were in the two editions. So first edition of the book published 2005, is that right? Yeah. Second edition published 2013. Take us back in time. What were the um, <coughs> decision points for you in terms of FCC regulatory <laughs> issues of the day, uh, broader thinking about the impact of the book writ large in that 2005 to 2013 timeframe. And as you think about 2013 to present, what sort of uh, front of mind for what could come next in the third edition? Sure. So, well, so the third edition is um, will happen. Uh, no <laughs> <laughs> wiser or some other job. Stand in for them as best I can. Um, but I, look, I think that there's some of the some of you know, and we'll have to see what the F 
what, what the FCC does in the next couple of years, because there's a big policy agenda. To the extent that that goes forward, it will determine a lot of what gets discussed. But I think a lot of the big, uh, of the big questions are going to be to ask, to what extent are some of the big debates and policy issues of you know, the early 2000s and even 2013, how have those evolved, how have they changed, how have the market structure changed the questions underlying those debates? So there's still access to affordability issues. And to what extent are some of the regulatory programs that we're talking about in previous editions going to be relevant? How will they transform? How will we think about them from what the new world? So there will be echoes of all of those themes, I would imagine, depending on what the, uh, what the FCC does. There's been a lot of good thinking about, about that. I see Tejas here who's on one of the panels. He's written a very interesting work about where there is still space for an affordability regulatory regime, but a very, <laughs> in a very different way than we used to see. And then I think a big question is going to be, what are we talking about when we're talking about telecom? In 2023 or 2025, whenever you know the third edition comes out, because to the extent that there is a melding of infrastructure and big tech and how those things interoperate, I think we're going to be uh, talking a lot more about the kinds of um, network economic ideas. How do we take sort of light-handed uh, interoperability regulation of a kind that was incredibly helpful? For wireless competition and for you know, various other areas, how do we transport that and talk about that in the context of big tech? Again, people are writing about it, so there's an intellectual infrastructure that we're going to get to build on. But I think we're also going to want to look very hard at what does the world look like, what is the what has the FCC done, and then bring these tools to bear. <coughs> so uh, you asked to put myself back. Uh, 20 some 21 years now. So 21 is the age of the, the concept of the book. And in 2002, we had a very different set of issues at this conference we're discussing. And people, people were, it's, it's fun to think about now. Um, but it seems ridiculous. We were arguing about um, the terms on which um, new entrance into the all important market for circuits which landline phones could take hold in the US. And all the debates were about unbundled network elements. Is the Uni platform really a good idea um, for, for entry? Uh, and the, the earliest incarnations of the manuscript tend, tended to focus really hard on those <laughs> legacy questions about the landline circuit switch telephone. Um, between 2002 and the end of 2004, when we submitted the manuscript, it became obvious that those were yesterday's debates. And so we started condensing um, the, the discussion of the 96 acts in the book and expanding the discussion of the internet, uh, broadband policy, open access. Uh, and uh, net neutrality, a, a concept that in some ways got its one of its first public hearings here at Silicon Plant Irons in 2004 with Michael Powell came by to um, discuss his, his, his views on that topic. So we, we used to have this long chapter on Telric. Does anyone know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that ended up in, in, because we realized that it wasn't going to play a big role anymore. Uh, and then it vanished altogether in the second edition. In the second edition, we sort of uh, we followed the same trajectory. Uh, we significantly reduced the discussion of landline altogether, whether landline calls or landline calls. You know, there's still some some discussion of that in there, but we focused much more on spectrum policy. Um, on net neutrality and on issues relating to uh, the regulation or forbearance from regulation of global broadband providers. Um, and I think for this next edition, one of the things that makes it exciting for us, because uh, we don't want it to be just an update, we don't want it to be a pocket part for the second edition. Um, the thing that's exciting for us is to kind of think more broadly about how the themes of the first 
two additions translate into today's policy debates. And I see that Rick Witt is here. I'm going to give him a shout out because this is the guy who popularized the notion of aligning um, uh, company, tech and telecom regulation with the layers of the internet. And I, 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 you know, one of the theses that we'll try out and we'll see how it writes is that at the end of the day, you want the same types of policy calls to be made at different layers of the uh, of the internet ecosystem. So, if the questions of market power, questions of network effects, to the extent they arise on any layer, that you can rise to analogous policy solutions uh, as they go on. Um, that you know, as a per, it's it, it's potentially a controversial thing to say. Uh, and we'll, as I say, we'll see how it writes. There might be you know, specific considerations that require different treatment uh, from one layer to the next, but we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. so, so to pick up on that, the title of uh, this weekend's conference was uh, The Internet's Midlife Crisis. And a lot of the debate yesterday and to some extent today focused on the, the tech titans in Silicon Valley who sort of fall at a different position in the, in, in the layered stack. If you think about... Um, the concepts that have been in the first two editions of Digital Prospers. <laughs> do they um, foretell a future where you know, traditional providers of connectivity were, were the subject of the first two editions are, are less important going forward? Or uh, to the point you just raised about you know, concepts of regulatory parity, how, how does this all play out? <laughs> well, there, the, the physical layer is always going to be important because there's no other way to get the applications to the people. Um, and so I don't think it will become less important. Um, I do think that uh, the industry dynamics might change and to the extent that, this is still an open question, to the extent that you have genuine competition between uh, fixed broadband providers and mobile broadband providers. We, we have um, the potential for a degree of competition in the physical layer that uh, we haven't previously had, and I mean we've had some competition, um, you know, over the last twenty years. But what T-Mobile, for example, is doing with offering home broadband, maybe it's not quite ready for prime time yet. I don't know. Um, but to the extent that that policymakers and carriers can find creative ways to deliver high bandwidth connectivity to people in their homes, so that you can. Um, so you, so you can support your own Wi-Fi network with, with uh, mobile carrier connections. That has the potential to double the number of competitors in any given area. And that is a potentially exciting development if it happens. I mean, and obviously that will connect to spectrum policy and a variety of other issues that we're talking about. You know, the, the history of telecom is littered with the promise of new competitive technologies that would allow bypass of incumbent access points. Um, some have some have worked, some have not. And I think one of the exciting periods about writing, you know, that we're in right now is we'll get to see does the T-Mobile experiment and things like it, you know, will that will that really be a game changer? But I think, you know, Travis, to your question, sure. I mean, access is incredibly important, but it's gone from being the dog to being the tail. Because the, if you look at the value creation, the value chain, it's in all the layers that you know Rick was focusing us on 20 years ago. It's you know that is really where we're going. In. So the reason you have big public policy debates now, and if you ask people on the street, what do you think of being wireless? You get a yawn. Yeah, I mean, who cares, right? Ask them what they think about big digital platforms. And you know, we heard all kinds of stuff yesterday, but you can't say people don't care. They're very strong views. And that's because that's where the value, that the bulk of the value is, the bulk of the activity, the bulk of the audience focus. So I think that, you know, to John's point, and you know, there, as a, there are a lot of people who, who keep reminding us, don't lose focus with all the choice appears to be out there and all of the capability that appears to be on our hands once you have access don't lose focus on the access the distribution of access the affordability of access that will remain important but if just as a matter of the amount of value that's being created it's going to be a lesser public policy vote 
difference going forward. Except for with respect to spectrum policy. Except, except, uh, I think that, that that's probably right. Yeah. So uh, we heard yesterday from, from Senator Bennett and others about the need for a new regulatory construct to deal with big tech or privacy issues. And the last chapter of the first two editions of, of Digital Crossroads sort of seized on the question of um, going forward to the regulatory construct of FCC, NCA, others be different? Should there be a, a favored uh, or antitrust policy and the like? So with the benefit of hindsight now, looking back on, on the first two editions of, of the book and looking at sort of the, the debates that are playing out today and, in, in uh, at our conference, how does that all meld together? What 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 did the book get right? What did it get wrong? What were the questions asked? How, how do you see the, the the tension in terms of uh, regulators in Washington versus antitrust policy? Can you reflect on those thoughts? Sure. I mean, I, I think one of the things that we got wrong in the very first edition was a um, was that we missed the role of um, externalities uh, to some extent. And what I mean by that is um, there are two potential justifications for regulatory intervention to ensure what people colloquially call net neutrality. One of them is a lack of full competition uh, sufficient to um, impose competitive discipline on the players. But the other is also the, um, the, the benefit that society gains from uh, from having a neutral platform for uh, uh, innovation, free expression, civic engagement. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the results of the debate should be any different, but I think that we, in the first edition, we focused too much on entirely, entirely on the competition issue. I think there's a passage in there where we say something like, if there were 10 broadband providers in any given area, there'd be no, no, no plausible basis for regulatory intervention. I think that's simplistic. I think that <coughs> there were 10 competitors, there might still be a basis for regulatory intervention if you were concerned that the internet was going to fragment as a, a result of um, a lack of public oversight. Uh, so the, really the question is, is there enough competition and do we need to worry about internet fragmentation? Those are separate questions. And I, we, we focus a little more on, on the second of those questions in the second edition. I think we're going to focus even more on it uh, in, in the third edition. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, look, I think that there were certain things in telecom that we would always talk about as being appropriate for ex post kind of antitrust type enforcement. Um, there were other things that I think were well understood to fall more in the basket of traditional common carrier regulation or monopoly control regulation. I think that the boundary has become much more porous in people's thinking about that. I see Electro Valenti who's got a nice paper talking about bringing competition and regulatory approaches and it's sort of a comprehensive approach to a lot of uh, uh, big tech uh, regulatory questions. I think that you know, we will definitely look at that, but I'll just give you an example. There's a real developing sense that you can simultaneously have ex post antitrust enforcement for certain kinds of monopolization activities for merger, you know, activities for things like that, but still have inter an interoperability regime applying to those same, uh, same enterprises. And I think that um, seeing how interconnection, interoperability, access apply, and how you can actually have workable rules so that you get a, a blend of sort of ex post for certain conduct, but ex ante rules on the road for how these uh, networks will, will uh, uh, interoperate with new entrants, with new platforms, is going to be a big part of what we're going to be thinking about in the book. And you know, to John's point, it brings back a lot of old themes uh, from telecom. When you're thinking about the internet splintering, what, do you, what are you worried about? What you're worried about is that people will be talking through different pipes, different silos, not cross communicating. And if we're in a world where broadcast is more or less dead, that the, the idea of a shared set of a few big content networks that we're all getting information from, you know, is sort of ebbed, do we really want a completely splintered internet where people are communicating and sharing content <coughs> with information or misinformation? 
in ways that never see different viewpoints, different information, and may not even be monitored. That's a concern that a number of people have read. If you, if you do start to see the internet splinter, is a way of getting around that, having interoperability amongst these different networks. And, and to Joan's point, the traditional antitrust view that you know eight or seven or something like that networks is enough. Sure, for price and output, that's probably right. If you have these other kinds of social objectives and you're worried about splintering and you're worried about misinformation and access and communication, probably not. And then you might want to have an interoperability regime on top of it, regardless of the competition. Or net neutrality regime as well. But the, yeah. the, the challenge there is to tailor the, um, the net neutrality regime to the externalities you're trying to preserve. And that means focusing on what rules are necessary to keep the really bad thing from happening. Um, as opposed to what rules are necessary to promote abstract notions of, of neutrality, for its own sake. Yeah, you both recently authored a, um, an article in the, the Federal Communications Law Journal, and one of the, the subheadings in the article was reconciling competition policy with social equity. Can you unpack what that means for the audience and what your views are? Did you put my name on that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the book, the, the, the first two editions of Digital Crossroads were almost entirely about competition policy. And even when those editions address universal service, each one had a, a, a chapter entitled Universal Service, the focus was um, how do you reconcile universal service with competition policy? So it wasn't really about um, the underlying social equity goals. It was more how can you administer a universal service program in a competitively neutral way uh, so as not to create undue market distortions. And I think we're going to broaden the focus this time. We're going to the first step is to retitle the chapter digital equity uh, rather than uh, universal service because obviously the the concept today encompasses much more of that. Um, is, is simply funding for uh, you know, lifeline and uh, for, for broadband networks in rural communities and much broader societal issues at stake. Yeah, and I mean, just to add to that, you know, lifeline was important, right? You needed to be able to get a connection in case of emergency. The what's at stake is so much greater when you see kids sitting in the parking lot of a fast food you know, restaurant just to use the Wi Fi during COVID. <laughs> That the, the equity notion goes a lot broader than I might need access to a line to call the fire department to this is now essential to education. The access is now access to something much bigger than a point to point communication. And so equity is definitely the concept. The question is, what does that mean? What is needed? It's a much more dynamic definition now, I think, as we're moving into ways in which that kind of access is essential. When the Department of Veteran Affairs thinks about going to a fully online network and you're talking about homeless veterans, where's the access? Where's the ability to you know, get benefits to which you are entitled and that people want to reach you? So we have a, lot, we have a much richer, uh, I think, set of issues to think about. All right, I want to save a, a few minutes for audience questions. We're going to go to a lightning round. So I'm going to ask you to keep your answers very brief. Um, first, pick one and why, FCC, NTIA, or FTC? <laughs> well, that's you get to decide the purpose. I'm going to go with my most recent agency, the FTC. So all about Spectrum FTC. Uh, you're king for, the, for a day. What one thing could you change about telecom law regulation? <laughs> wow. Um, Stunned. All right. We'll pass on that. Uh, all right. Before we open up to audience questions, you both have been frequent flyers when it comes to uh, uh, the February conference. Uh, we're back in person for the first time in quite a while. Uh, are there favorite? I'm asking for your favorite memory ever there this weekend or, or years past. I don't. I don't have anecdotes for this, um, but I do have people in mind. And Phil obviously is central to anyone's conception of this conference. And 
one of the great things about writing a book with Phil was that I had an excuse to talk to Phil every day. And, um, and there's really nothing better than talking to Phil every day. But the two other people that um, immediately come to mind here are Dale Hatfield, which Dale is in many ways the inspiration for this book. Every time someone talks about uh, Dale's legacy here, Dale has, it does this. <laughs> but Dale's the other reason why, why this program has been such a success. The third person I want to mention, and it's in memoriam, uh, is uh, Judge Stephen Williams, who came almost every year. Uh, both Howard and I clerked for him. Uh, what a fun intellectual experience it was to have any kind of conversation with him. And uh, he is sorely I can't say it any better. Yep. All right, so we have uh, just a few minutes, so we'll open up for audience questions. Uh, students, if you're in the room, please, uh, you, uh, why is the role you go first? Jump in. Uh, so I'm a two up here at Colorado Law. Uh, as someone who has gotten into telecom law in the last year, this book is recommended by lots of people to me constantly. Uh, what I would ask is in the 10 years since the second edition came out, like what's the biggest like context that I should like kind of read with a grain of salt because of changes that have happened since it come out? The universal service chapter. <laughs> Don't read it. It's 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 a slog to begin with. <laughs> Not that Phil wrote that part. <laughs> All right, Blake is, is giving me the, the, the X, so I think we need to clear the room. I want you to join me in thanking Howard and John for 